Pterosaurs are super cool and I love them, but they have the worst fossil record among the Mesozoic rulers of the Earth. They were the most hollow, and hollow bones don't survive the rock cycle or the fossilization process particularly well, so they are often fragmentary. Australia was home to a bunch of pterosaurs, just like every other continent, but their record is wonky. A brand new study describes some tantalizing bits that provide a brief mysterious glimpse to the true diversity of the region in the Mesozoic. There's a lot of things we now know about the distant past that seemed impossible only a few decades ago. Discovering the colors of fossilized animals, fragments of collagen and dinosaur bones, and even finding near-complete remains of previously enigmatic animals like Dinochilus and Spinosaurus. But there's still a lot of things we don't know, and never will. The fossil record is a spotty and broken mess, very incomplete. Even as we answer some questions, others remain frustratingly unanswered, and even more questions are raised. Evolution, missing links, behavior, coloration, all will be explored on Paleo Mystery. The paleontological record of Australia has been particularly interesting. There's a lot of Cenozoic stuff, but not a ton of Mesozoic stuff. Mesozoic stuff has been found there since people first started looking, but it was never like it is in other countries. The last half century has continuously shed more light on the super bizarre Cretaceous fauna of the island continent. There were armored titanosaurs, swift meat hook carrying mega raptors, big nosed ornithopods, swift footed long tailed dryosaur types, and the most ancient and isolated groups of ankylosaurs so far found. What about the flyers? The pterosaurs? Shouldn't they be less unusual on account of them flying? Well, the entire global pterosaur record isn't the best, and it's not great in Australia either, but stuff is still found. The known Australian pterosaur fossil record is pretty much currently restricted entirely to the Cretaceous period of Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia, and Victoria. The majority of these remains come from Queensland thanks to the Aramanga Basin. So far, the ones found with enough remains to get a good description, name, and phylogenetic placement have been Mithonga, Aussie Draco, Thapungaka, and Pharaoh Draco. All of those are ornithochiriforms, which is pretty interesting. Those were the big sailing fellows with the long snouts capped by fronds of long pointy teeth and sometimes crests on the top, bottom, or both sides of the snout tips. Some anomalous bits have been found of some possible tenochasmatoid pterosaurs, but nothing of the pteranodonts, ashtarchids, or anything else. On top of all that, most Australian pterosaur material is super fragmentary, which does not help scientists place them in an evolutionary tree. Despite this setback, it has been done, though definitely open to change if better stuff is found. Some more bits without names have been recovered from New South Wales, including my favorite type of fossil, opalized fossils. Two opalized teeth were found in the Cenomanian aged Grimmin Creek Formation and described in 2017. The team that described them figured they best matched the chompers of the Anhangwerians, a group of the ornithochiriforms I mentioned earlier and close relatives to many other Australian pterosaurs. Some of those named Australian pterosaurs I mentioned earlier are also tentatively Anhangwerians. Two more semi-ambiguous pterosaur specimens have been uncovered from Western Australia. One is a fragmentary jaw of another crest-snouted sailor from the Cenomenian to the Coniacian-aged molecap greensand described in 2010. And the other is a chunk of ulna from the Maastrichtian-aged Myria formation described in 1991. A brand new study helmed by Adele Pentland, Patricia Vickers Rich, Thomas Rich, Samantha Rigby, and Stephen Poropot, published in the journal Historical Biology and International Journal of Paleobiology at the end of May 2023, finally does what had not yet been fully done with a collection of Australia's oldest pterosaur fossils. Two specimens, NMV P185973 and NMV P186084, were found in the lower portion of the Eumerala Formation of Victoria. 
The area of this formation from which these fossils came is a volcanogenic sandstone and claystone which were deposited in a river setting that was dominated mostly by large and small river channels. This formation dates to the Albion Age of the early Cretaceous Epoch, which is technically sort of the middle of the Cretaceous, the very end of the early Cretaceous Epoch. Both specimens were collected more specifically from the Slippery Rock fossil site at Dinosaur Cove, which is situated near Cape Otway. The first specimen, NMV P185973, was found all the way back in 1986, while the second specimen, NMV P186084, was found in 1989. Both are assumed to be from two different individuals due to a strong difference in size, even with both specimens being two separate parts of the body. The first specimen, NMV P185973, has been damaged since it was first found in the 80s and figured in 2000. Part of the lateral margin is now missing. This specimen is simply a fragmentary part of the pelvis, the part called a synsacrum. The second specimen, NMV P186084, has never been described in any way, but was mentioned in a technical article all the way back in 2018 and some books in 2000 and 2020. This specimen is simply a hand bone, a metacarpal. That's it. Both of these specimens were preserved in rocks that were at high latitudes at the time they were laid down. This is highly unusual for pterosaurs. The majority of pterosaur fossils, or most fossils for that matter, do not come from high latitudes. This may reflect the biology and ecology of the fossil organisms, or it may reflect how hard it is for biological material to survive, become buried, and fossilized in the mountains. The majority of the known high-latitude pterosaurs come from Antarctica. I feel like this is biased though since Antarctica currently has the highest average elevation of all continents. But that's with ice, so maybe it wasn't as high, but it would have still been pretty high? I don't know. But like, there isn't as much variation going on there, so of course the pterosaurs from there would be found in high paleolatitudes, is all I'm trying to say. Could be wrong though. Those guys are represented mostly by earlier pterosaur groups, like Dimorphodontids and Ramphorhynchids. There is also a pterodactyloid specimen known from the Cretaceous of Vega Island. There are some fossil trackways of pterosaurs from Cretaceous Alaska and Alberta. So these newly described pterosaur bits from Australia are further proof that these critters did live in higher latitudes as well. One last note here is that the authors of the new paper have interpreted the hand bone as that of a juvenile pterosaur. They are inferring this due to its size. There is no way to know for sure that this belongs to a juvenile other than cutting it open to do some histologic studies on the inside bits. They think it belonged to a juvenile based on size since it is remarkably small when compared to the same bone of small sized pterosaurs from the same time, but from different continents. It is possible it just belonged to a really small little critter, but the team think the most parsimonious answer here is that it was a youngin. That's about it. They cannot be confidently attributed to any group of pterosaurs outside of generic pterosaur, since the majority of the Australian pterosaur fossil record is of the crest-snouted ornithochiris grade pterosaurs, it is most likely that these pieces also belong to these types of pterosaurs. But the possibility remains that they are from known groups that have yet to crop up in the fossil record of Australia. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.